Real Life presents the Jack Hibbs Podcast with intention and boldness to proclaim truth, equip the saints, and impact our culture. Hey, everybody, stay tuned. We've got an amazing question that you're going to want to hear the answer to. You're going to want to hear the question asked. And we're also going to be talking about how do you, how do I get ready to meet the Lord Jesus Christ? Stay tuned. You can get the outlines of this podcast by going to jackhibbs.com slash podcast. Today, if this podcast lifts you up and encourages you to live a more fulfilled life in Christ, then make sure you leave us one of those five-star ratings. To us, that's like saying amen or yes. Then that rating will encourage others to listen. Now open your hearts to what God's Word has to say to you. Here is Jack Hibbs. Hey, you guys, welcome to our podcast today, and uh, we're getting a lot of activity regarding these end time events, so uh, we're going to, you know what, we're just going to keep going until that well dries up, I guess, to a point, and uh, one of the things that um, we're responding to, uh, many of you sincerely have been uh, really examining where your faith is, which is awesome if this podcast can get you just to that point where uh, are you really a believer? What is it that you believe? How can you know for sure about anything? Uh, that If we can answer that or at least point you toward the Bible, which is the, the truth, uh, then great. Then we've done a good work and God is honored. And listen, your soul is satisfied uh, because Christ does that stuff. For those of you who know what I'm talking about, Jesus satisfies souls. And so, listen, right now we're going to take up the question. We've got three of them in total. We're going to do one right now, and then we'll get into the mailbag, so to speak, and I'll look at some of the questions that have come to us. So number one for today, and I'll try to knock this off in 20 minutes or so because I know you're busy and you're on your way. Uh, how can you get ready? You've talked a lot about the rapture, Pastor Jack. How can, how can you get ready? Number one way to get ready is to make sure that you have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ, not your church, not your mosque, not your synagogue, not your nothing. Jesus only. See, what does that mean? Very simply answered the book of John chapter 3. In fact, why don't you, when you read it, read John 3. Project yourself into John 3 and put on Nicodemus' sandals, put on his robe, and have a sit down with Jesus. It's so perfect. I'm not kidding. Get in chapter 3 of John and sit in Nicodemus' seat and let Jesus speak to you. And Jesus is going to tell you, don't you know that it's impossible for you to enter the kingdom of heaven? It's not going to matter about your religiosity. It's not going to matter about how moral you are. It's not going to matter how great you are. It doesn't matter if you're a Jew or Gentile. It doesn't matter. What is required for you to get into heaven is that you be born again. Jesus used the word born again. Well, in the English version of the Bible, it's born again. Uh, the word is actually born from above or have a second birth. And Jesus explains it. So number one, you start in John chapter three, okay? That's what you want to do in your step to getting ready. Number two is that you want to continue on from that moment. Let's say you accept Christ today. You continue on growing in the grace and knowledge of God. What does that mean? It means that you, listen, it means just like a baby's born. Now, I don't know how it is today. Uh, my kids are in their 40s, so um, I don't know how it is today. But when our babies were born, uh, they couldn't go home from the hospital until they pooped, they peed, and they started to nurse. And when that happened, then the doctors or the nurse or whoever signed off on our kids and basically says, okay, uh, they've come through production, uh, they've gone through inspection, and now they're, uh, they're released. And so out of the hospital we went. They were able to poop, they were able to pee, they were able to eat. And so what happened? Their lives began. Same is true about being born again. We need, as we get born again, we need to desire the sincere, listen to this, Milk of the word, the Bible says. And so you start intaking the Bible. Giving your heart to Christ is your salvation. From that moment on is called discipleship. That means you keep going now. And true salvation in your life is the beginning of an amazing journey, an amazing story 
of God working in your life. That's how you get ready. Third thing is this, is that you be always aware that Christ could come at any time. Thus, we were talking about the rapture. You need to be one who is discerning the times and the seasons in which you live and where you live. What's going on globally? What's going on? And am I ready to meet Jesus? And you might naturally say, well, what if Jesus doesn't come back in my lifetime? You win. It's awesome. You win anyway. Why? Because you die ready. We, sh we should live and die ready, meaning always ready to meet Jesus, right? It's, it's, a, it's, a, um, it's foolproof, or what's the term? Fail-safe. It's a fail-safe. If you're born again, and you're growing as a disciple in Jesus Christ, and you are looking for his coming— Throughout Scripture, we're admonished, be looking, be looking, be looking, watch. Uh, you're going to be made complete at His appearing. All of these Scriptures, when you live like that, you're prepared for two things. Number one, the rapture. Number two, for death. It works out great. Can I throw a fourth thing in that I wasn't going to throw in? Number four, you'll be happy. It's a great way to live. Why? Because, listen, when you live like that— um, the, the Bible says in the Old Testament that the righteous, they, they are as bold as lions. You get to live before Jesus every day. You live before God every day. And that really keeps you clean, keeps your spirit clean. When temptations come, you just say, get out of here. When that thought comes, hey, just click here. Take a peek. No one's going to be looking. That's called Satan tempting. Don't do it. Don't do it. Recognize it. Say, wait a minute. I recognize that. Nope. Lord, I'm asking you in Jesus' name, Lord, rebuke Satan from my life. And you get up and go, you know how wonderful it is to live free like that? And should I die or should the Lord come back with the trumpet blast? I'm ready. So it's absolutely thrilling. How can I be ready to meet Jesus? That's how. That's how. Start there with all those things that we just laid out. Those four things. Be free. Um, I'll throw this in. Sorry, I don't remember who said it. My genre of reading is Charles Spurgeon, J.C. Ryle, a lot of Martin Lloyd-Jones, Harry Ironside could have said it, A.W. Tozer, C.S. Lewis. I might be missing somebody, but that's kind of my, my main go-to stuff. And um, I might have been C.S. Lewis who said that it appears that those who believe that Jesus could come at any time are those who did the most on earth before heaven. I love that. It might have been Jonathan Edwards. Doesn't matter. You can search it and see. Those who had a premillennial, pre-tribulational, imminent doctrine view of Christ's return do the most now because they we sense that we're running out of time, so let's get it done. Motivation. And that commentator, that great that came before us, stated in his research, it seems as though that those who believe that Jesus could come back at any time did the most for the kingdom of heaven while here on earth. Beautiful word. Okay, we have some questions. Um, let's take this one just because it is so much fun. I think I have the time. I'm looking at the producer guys. I think we're okay with time. Um, this is a whopper. Um, it's right here. So, you know, I'm not making it up, but it is a lot of fun. So I'm sorry I don't have your name. So, but you'll know who you are. Um, you say, hey, Jack, if you believe all kids are raptured, how do you explain Psalm 58.3? This is what Psalm 58.3 says, by the way. The wicked are estranged from the womb. That's everyone. Every human being is estranged from the womb. In fact, you want to be even more, let's take your microscope and go electron microscope. David said about that, I was conceived in sin. Wow. So David was not only conceived in sin, David admits, David declares the truth that w the wicked are estranged from the womb. That means we're programmed to sin. No doubt about it, my friend. So, they go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. You put a question mark. No, when you're born, you can't speak. You can only nurse, poop, and pee, right? 
You have the, all the lying. You have murder capabilities. You have lying capabilities. You have suicide capabilities. You have fill in the blank. Do you understand what I'm saying? You have the sin nature. You and I were born with the sin nature. Here's the amazing thing, my friend. You're missing a big, big point. Is that God does not hold us accountable for the, the, the doing of sin until we are aware of the law. Read the book of Galatians. Read the book of Romans. And that will be very clear. God will not hold a five-year-old accountable for his sins if the rapture happens at the time of a five-year-old's life. Because the five-year-old doesn't... That's By the way, that's why... Evangelicals do not baptize uh, babies at birth. They don't. What are they repenting of? You're supposed to believe on the, repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you shall be saved. That's the gospel. The gospel begins with the word metanoia. Repent. How does a how does a three four five, how does a six month old repent and believe in the Lord Jesus Christ with water baptism being the source of salvation? That's crazy. That's church. Tradition, that's not biblical theology. To repent means you must come to the understanding that you have violated the law of God and that you are willfully asking God to forgive you of your sins because you recognize that Jesus died on the cross for your sins, he rose again from the dead, and that now you're putting your faith in him to save you from your sins. We do not baptize kids unless they're able to tell us in the waters of baptism can you tell me why you're being baptized today? And listen, when a nine-year-old says, because I'm a wretch, <laughs> I'm a sinner, I ask them, what do you mean by that? Because I've been reading my Bible since I was five, and I've come to the realization I'm a liar. I, I, I stole money from my mom's purse. That's, that makes me a thief. And Jesus died on the cross for my sins. And I want him to forgive me, and I want to be baptized because I prayed to receive him when I was four or five, but I didn't realize what I was doing until in Sunday school here at church I heard the gospel and it clicked. Friends, that can happen. That can happen like Charles Spurgeon uh, at an age in his early teens. That could happen when you're 25. It can happen, uh, you know, when you're aware, like in this kid I'm referring to, nine years of age. You have to be aware of sinning. So, friend, listen, you go on to say this, and this is where your question gets really, really, I mean, look, it's kind of dumb. Follow me with this. According to your belief, Pastor Jack, and you, he's, you said you're really off, you blew this one, Pastor Jack. Had Joe Biden, Adolf Hitler, Barack Obama, Klaus Schwab, Bill Gates, Anthony Fauci, Aleister Crowley, he invented the Church of Satan in San Francisco, of course, um, died as children, they would go to heaven. Correct, friend. You said, ridiculous. Well, that's, that's your theology. The Bible doesn't hold those guys, would not have held those guys accountable at the age that they didn't know what they were doing. Think about that. Adolf Hitler didn't know. See, you know Adolf Hitler now, but Adolf Hitler in the womb, you're holding his sins accountable to him in the womb or at the age of three or at the age of six? Come on, that's ridiculous. You want to talk about ridiculous? That's ridiculous because you're acting like God. That's, that's really nuts, because that, that thing, same thing could be applied to you. According to your logic, you're not going to heaven. It gets worse. You said, not only that, but seeing as the majority of people grow up to reject the Lord, if all babies and children go to heaven via the rapture or death, that would make abor abortion a huge blessing. That's wild. Why? Because people who otherwise would have grown up to reject the Lord and be consigned to the lake of fire would instead be in heaven. And let's not forget, you said, love not freely given is not love. Uh, that I do agree with that. Love not freely given is not love. I don't know what that has to do with your assessment of 
um, we should abort people before they have the chance to, of rejecting the gospel so they don't wind up in hell. Think, think of what your logic is. You, you're citing love not freely given is not love. You, your logic is saying, let's kill people before they have the chance to exercise the choice of love, God or not. That's kind of Hitler-esque, right? Let's annihilate. Now, this is very strange because you're actually in your argument saying that People in the future who are going to sin beyond the age of accountability and reject the gospel of Jesus, it's better for them to die in the womb or to be killed before they reach that point. Your argument actually is um, uh, robotica. What is it? It, uh, it is, um, it's, 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 it's a, a doomsday time. I'm missing the word. It's uh it's a thought process of, of um, hopelessness. It's weird. Jesus died on the cross for sinners. If I apply your logic, then all sinners would be removed before birth. Then what did Jesus die for? The unborn only? Did Jesus die for only those who are under the age of 5 or 6 or 11? The age of accountability is, is, is not a number, by the way. It's the person's ability to comprehend that they are rejecting God. I mentioned before, that's in, the, that's in the manifestation of teen rebellion. Teen rebellion is announcing to you, mom and dad, that the kid is saying, I am slipping away from your faith covering. I'm now able to start thinking on my own. Thus, I don't think I need to obey you anymore. I don't think I need to clean my room because who are you to tell me what to do? And teen rebellion is my teachers are stupid. Uh, the Pope is stupid. Uh, my parents are stupid. Uh, that judge is stupid, the president's stupid, everything's stupid, I'm the only one that's smart. Can't, why can't people see that? That's called teen rebellion. What's going on? Age of accountability is popping up. You, and they need to get their questions answered. Mom and dad, listen, you're, you better be taking your kid to a good Bible teaching church that has an awesome youth group that teaches Bible, not tiddlywinks or foosball or um, marbles. I'm old. That's only the stories I have. I don't know. Xbox. God forbid, a youth group ministry should be powerful to answer questions like this that honestly can be easily refuted because the psalmist is talking about the fact that we're born sinners. That's why Christ came and died on the cross. But we don't know about that until we're convicted by the Holy Spirit. John chapter 14, John chapter 16. The Holy Spirit will come and convict us of sin. That does not happen to three-year-olds. It happens to people who are in the age of accountability. And when you're convicted of your sin, then you run to Christ for forgiveness. And you get forgiveness because metanoia. You repent of your sins and you ask him to forgive you. And then knowing that he rose from the dead is your justification from the penalty of sin. And you're placed into the body of Christ. So listen, uh, I love your question. It's crazy nuts. But uh, if this is your, if this is really your, your thought process, then, um, then, Either A, you're not a Christian and you need to become a Christian, or B, you are, or you are a Christian and you've been wrongly taught about the sovereignty of God and the imparted sovereignty of man. God gave us that sovereignty, which justifies your uh, comment at the end, which I agree with. Love not freely given is not love. I can read it upside down or backwards better than I can read it forwards. Um, you're contradicting yourself. So that's very, very important. Um, listen, like always, you guys, we'd love for you to hit the subscribe button. Please help us. I'm not begging you at all, exactly. I'm pleading with you. How's that? Hit the subscribe button. It gets a hold of the people in the tech world, bumps us up some, and uh, sends a message. We'd love for you to share this if it's making a difference in your life. If it's not, I've got other things to do, and so do you. But as always, it's time to live out what you believe in. And that's why we are all about real life. So God bless you guys until next time. This Jack Hibbs podcast, as well as all the broadcast outreach opportunities are listener supported. Will you consider partnering with us through a special gift? Go to jackhibbs.com to learn more and stay connected.